<coughs> Hi all. So I will present this uh, um, joint work of my, uh, my lab, Semantic Technology Lab from Italian CNR. Um, this is uh, actually the, the work blossomed from the master thesis of Francesco Draicchio, who's not here, um, and then uh, evolved with, with the <coughs> contribution of other tools from the lab and uh, competencies. Um, so that's what the paper is about. And in principle, after this slide, I could just stop. So <laughs> this is uh, the idea that uh, to take seriously the idea of making uh, machine reading, so-called this term comes back to Oren in 2006, <coughs> of producing uh, automatically unsupervised um, um, knowledge from text. Okay? So as you can see in this example, uh, if you take a sentence or a, two sentences like this, uh, the one on the top about John McCarthy's death, uh, then we can produce automatically in a short time a RDF graph with some old constructs as well that manage <coughs> to represent uh, frames or events and uh, semantic roles and types of entities that are recognized, um, taxonomies based exploiting compositionality of terms, and uh, we make also, uh, can resolve coreference, some uh, entity uh, recognition and resolution and linking, and uh, <coughs> also treat uh, a bit of more complicated constructs like meta level. When you say, for example, here, New York Times reported that, okay, it is a bit difficult, but with uh, this event based, uh, it's treatable, okay? So <coughs> this gives you the idea of what we have done. Now, I will show you what we have done and uh, what are the, um, the different perspectives and problems that are behind this work. Um, the, this will, there, there will be, by the way, a demo poster about Fred in, uh, just after uh, this session or the next, I don't, this session? That's 4.30 uh, 4 uh, today. So uh, visit us for having no, um, a concrete uh, grasp of it. So the outline, I will talk a bit about this idea of making ontology rendering a bit more robust and uh, distinguishing statistical and rule-based approaches and um, what we have done by reusing uh, a deep parts and semantic deep parser called Boxer and now we translate it and transform this uh, out uh, output into uh, semantic web languages. So the idea of robust ontology learning is to have some fast and accurate natural language to uh, RDF out and it can be considered a mid to strong variety of machine reading. And uh, the idea is that to have good design quality of the <laughs> resulting ontologies. And um, for example, having more than just entities plus relations and to have aggregated data, uh, not just sparse axioms. Um, and this is, uh, well, relies on the fact that there are a couple of works at least that show that this is uh, sensible to do. Um, so there was a paper that showed that uh, using ontologies and patterns that can be derived easily from frames. And um, so you can have also, an, uh, and have also an equivalent conceptual expressivity besides having good formal semantics. And the work by Eva Blomqvist about, that provides evidence uh, about the fact that ontology learning methods can be improved uh, if the cycle of uh, learning is augmented with uh, design patterns. So the requirements then for doing this on the web, by the way, was that the ability to map natural language, so web of documents to RDFAL, which is the web of data, ability to capture <coughs> accurate semantic structures like complex relations or frames, and easy adaptation of, uh, uh, to the principles of linked data publishing, and of course, minimal computing time. <coughs> so the central question, by the way, was, then, can we map natural language to accurate and complete logical form for the web in reasonable time? <coughs> so here we have uh, two possibilities. So we have state-of-art statistical frame detection that is, by the way, not yet generalizable and fast. Uh, we have some relation extraction which approximates the task, like in open information extraction, <coughs> that, by the way, is not accurate and complete enough yet. Uh, on the other hand, we have rule-based frame detection that is uh, more generalizable, reasonably fast now, and decently accurate, complete, but is not yet portable to web standards, nor integrated with resolution and linking, and also brittle with uh, wild text. This last point, by the way, is not solved by us yet. <coughs> and, and of course, there is a warning. So full-fledged 
human natural language understanding requires too many layers to be considered achievable at this time in history. So we are still speaking about something that is <coughs> necessarily incomplete. So what can we do with statistical approaches nowadays? Uh, there are a lot of them, of course. I will exemplify a couple of them. Um, if we start from a, a text which is not completely trivial, this talks about this, uh, this guy, Cabeza de Vaca, who, uh, an adventurer from <laughs> Spain that <coughs> went to uh, Florida and the southern part of uh, US in, uh, the current US in uh, 16th century and you know, had some nice adventures. Not so nice for a lot of them, by the way. And uh, <laughs> so the, uh, <coughs> if you look, for example, this is quite a state of art uh, a commercial tool for shallow parsing called alchemy. So you can get some uh, relation extraction some uh, named entry recognition, some concept tagging, even subject classification with a good, uh, with a good quality. Still, all these facts are uh, sparse, besides the fact that they are, they are not yet in RDF, but this is secondary in a sense. The main part is that they are not, there is not a representation of the core meaning of the sentence. All these things are sparse. Um, so this is another example of entity resolution with uh, 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 recognition with resolution on something that is uh, standard. For example, this is uh, uh, one of our tools that makes uh, resolution uh, to DBpedia um, by reusing, uh, and this is uh, generalized, not just for a particular domain. Uh, but still here, we just get some entities with their URI, which is already something. But Then you can take all these uh, URIs, for example, and then you can put them in, uh, within the topology of linked data, like this nice visualization tool called RelFinder does. So in a sense here, we are creating a context uh, around all these entities, but it's not yet what we want. It's not about the text. It's about positioning these entities within a wider knowledge context. This is what Reverb, which is you know, state of art in relation extraction, in uh, fast relation extraction, uh, this work by Ezioni and others. And um, here, you know, there are two, uh, relations that are gathered, one with high confidence, actually, and they are reasonable enough. Yet we have two separate things, although very, um, uh, made in a very smart and quick way. Then we have this frame detector, which is more sophisticated. The frame is a complex structure, okay? So you need much more, um, many more components, much more training uh, in order to do it. So this is a state of art in frame detection called semaphore. It's a probabilistic frame parser, and here, you have some, at the end, you get some text annotation. So how to translate things like these into something that can be usable in, uh, uh, with semantic web standards and able to uh, make some, ena enable some reasoning. So <coughs> on the other hand, this, there are these deep parsing computational semantics approach. Here, for example, you can use syntactic parsers like this one is for categorical grammar that produces uh, the parses, and then you can put formal semantic interpretation on top of this syntax. This is what, for example, uh, this is the categorical parsing, what uh, Boxer, which is a tool for uh, this uh, sem deep semantic parsing, does. And as you can see here, the, 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 the target language here is uh, DRT. DRT is uh, the acronym for Discourse Representation Theory, and that uh, comes back to Hans Kamp. And, uh, uh, you know, it's basically fall, although for the logic, except you have some simplified quantification and uh, also the fact that there are certain particular uh, assumptions that are made. It's too long to, to repeat them here. By the way, the, the approach of Boxer is not directly a, a complete implementation of DRT, but it's a, a particular theory of uh, natural language semantics called computational semantics that has a DRT output and uses these eventualities, these David Davidsonian predicates for representing events. Um, this tool is quite good because also it provides semantic role labeling uh, with VerbNet and also we have some mapping to FrameNet. And, uh, and also you have uh, you know, some minimal statistical named entry recognition, sense tagging, tense logic or reference. So you can see that here we start having the, the, the kind of stuff we need in order to uh, arrive to this robust ontology learning that I've showed you at the beginning. Um, by the way, the problem is that this kind of stuff is quite difficult to digest and even to interpret in terms of RDF. So there, is, there has been some nice work, for example, Lodifier by um, uh, friends from uh, Keat, is something that is able to transfer directly to RDF the structures that are produced by Boxer. Um, the problem is that 
just translating the structure that is produced in DRT is not enough to have a sensible uh, data set or a sensible triples or even ontologies as they are, can be used on the semantic web. For example, here we have now these 28 variables. Okay? So what, do we, what are we going to do with them? Okay? Um, so <coughs> let's see what, uh, what, we, uh, what we have done in order to uh, make a, a translation and a transformation, the morphing, that allows us to, to, to work with these things and to populate automatically um, linked data from text. <coughs> so, by the way, before of that, uh, we have to explain if Boxer is good for making this uh, um, deep parsing. Intuitively, you have that and you say, okay, this looks pretty deep, but we have to measure it. So, <coughs> one thing is that since we know that frames are a good approach for at least for getting some interesting complex structures from text. Um, can we use Boxer for that? So in order to do that, we have made a, a minimal adaptation of it. Um, uh, for example, the Boxer reference knowledge base has been enriched with updated semlink mappings. Since Boxer uses verbnet roles by default in making this, um, this frame detection, um, and we have the mapping, then we can also uh, have frame, frame net roles. Uh, by the way, there is still room for improving this detection algorithm. For example, currently Boxer selects the first candidate frame with no ranking criteria. By the way, if, even with this uh, you know, minimal adaptation, uh, we have tried to compare the performance of what we have with Boxer to Semaphore, which is the state of art, uh, as I um, shown to you. And, and we applied it to the task which is most favorable to, to, to Semaphore SQL, because this task was based on uh, frame net frame structures, and, uh, and Semaphore was uh, trained on the, the frame net corpus, which only contains material that is uh, actually annotated with frames, so there are no unpredict unpredictable uh, results. Um, so the evaluation was, uh, so Semaphore was trained on this Semaval target corpus, and, uh, and we have built uh, um, uh, a new benchmark. So we have this frame net annotated corpus of sample frame sentences, more than 1,000 sentences, is fully annotated with at least one frame, and the benchmark automatically generated by randomly selecting data set sentences among the whole set. And of course, the usual measures, precision, recall, and uh, genetic coverage, and time efficiency, which is important for our requirement of having something that works in a reasonable time. So the evaluation component implements the same criteria used in the SEMEVAL task evaluation. So it compares the results of the two systems against the gold standard provided by the benchmark. And we assume the score one for exact match and 0.8 for uh, a mismatch, but is conceptually close or there is semantic gradients. There are some relations in frame that, that are very close and then can be generalized. So the results, here we have that semaphore has better F score in general, which is expectable. And uh, the performance, by the way, in the terms of precision is comparable. And uh, Boxer, by the way, is one order of magnitude faster, which is uh, a kind of favorable thinking about, uh, you expect that you know, something relying on uh, uh, probabilistic approaches, one strain is uh, very, very fast. Actually, this is not the case, at least with this, uh, with this uh, tool here, because the, the, the pipeline of components in order to recognize frames is quite heavy. And uh, so yet we have these kind of um, performances. Uh, when we have partial match, we can even see that, by the way, the precision comes really similar because the, uh, by taking a, a partial match to cl very close relations makes a performance of Boxer quite uh, almost identical. So why are these good results in general, although it's not as, uh, as good as it? So they show that rule-based approach can easily reach performances that are comparable to the current best frame detection tool. And the uh, detection algorithm can be further improved, as I told you, by enhancing frame disambiguation or extending the set of assembly mappings. And uh, reduced coverage can be explained and fixed because uh, Boxer currently exploits only partial frame net knowledge. Okay. Um, Okay, so the benchmark that we have uh, used put also Semaphore, as I told you, in a condition of advantage, and because Semaphore has been trained on FrameNet full text annotation, while for Boxer we don't need any training, and then we also can use it in, on uh, undifferentiated corpora. And also, you know, I repeat, we are faster. So now let's see what we do with that. So once we know that we can do something with this, uh, um, so we can actually detect frames in a, in a reasonable, uh, with a reasonable performance, uh, results with reasonable measures, let's see how we can move this to the semantic web for effective use. 
So the output format is uh, a main problem of existing probabilistic approaches to, because they do not provide a logical form as output. Uh, so Boxer provides a DRT-based logical representation. The problem is that, as we have seen, this logical representation is not as uh, uh, amenable as uh, uh, expected to um, RDF and OWL. So what we do is to translate and refactor Boxer output to OWL and RDF and then reach it with name entity recognition, resolution, word sense ambiguation, linking and alignment. So what do you expect typically to, when you put something into, into the, uh, the landscape of linked data? Uh, so let's go back to the leading example about our, uh, our friend Cabeza de Vaca. And uh, here you, uh, you have an, a web interface to Fred. Actually, oh, anyone can use it and test for, um, for your benefits. There are also REST services now. And um, out of it, we get no, this graph. This is a larger graph than the one you have seen before. I don't expect you to parse it and, uh, if <laughs> by uh, sightseeing. And, <laughs> So that, by the way, you can see here again uh, the features that I've shown you at the beginning. So you have the ability of uh, uh, recognize the co-reference uh, between uh, uh, Cabeza de Vaca and uh, the survivor set. The, uh, you can put custom namespaces or you can have uh, no, the frame departing and semantic roles like agent and uh, source. Um, and our localization here, like the part in. As you can see, we are not brittle with reference to how frames should be employed. So when you don't find, for example, a thematic role that comes from FrameNet or VerbNet, we uh, try to produce a new one in order to get the information that comes from the semantic parsing anyway. Um, also, no, we can guess types, types which can be both at the level of uh, um, um, of classes like place, but also at the level of, of types like uh, X, XST date. Also, we get this resolution and linking here. For example, North America is, uh, is got as a, as a uh, named entity, but is not resolved. So we add this uh, re resolution component and then we link it uh, with the same as to DBpedia North America. And we get also some taxonomy by exploiting the compositionality of terms here. For example, Royal Expedition is uh, analyzed as a subclass of Expedition. <coughs> and also we reuse some vocabularies. So I, I will give you some example of how this works. Um, okay, you have seen already that. So translation rules basically work in a top-down way. And uh, they start from DRT constructs. Um, I started later. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I assumed later. Okay, by the way. So, um, and move to uh, fault constructs and then some assumptions on how to translate these to our constructs. Um, then there are built in types of boxer that we directly map to common vocabularies like FOF, DBpedia, uh, Time Ontology, uh, Dolce Ultralight, OWL, and so on. And uh, so, what are, I re recap very quickly, what are the issues that we have found in that uh, had, uh, required our effort to build these heuristical rules. So firstly, that there are problems with variables. So there are a lot of discourse reference variables. Um, there is no terminology recognition extraction, no term compositionality, no periphrastic relations for properties. So in many cases, we need things like survivor of as an object property in our ontologies. And this is not automatically produced by uh, these uh, deep parsing tools. Um, sometimes the, you need some pragmatics so if you are parsing a definition, it's quite different from uh, the, the knowledge that you want to obtain. It's quite different from what you want to obtain if you are parsing just a description of uh, some action. Um, also, you may think about producing local restrictions uh, as in OWL. And, uh, <clears throat> and also, there is a lot of redundant boxing. So things made just for the notation that is of the syntax of DRT that need to be uh, get rid when it is redundant. So we use these heuristical maps. Uh, I can't present them all, of course, also because it's late. By the way, we apply things yeah, to um, like, you know, I mean, sometimes discourse reference reference variables made explicit. So if there is something we are talking about that is uh, important, like there is a survivor, there is someone who is a survivor, then you need to represent it as, a, as an instance or as a blank note. But we here follow the idea of not having blank notes at all in our uh, final representation. Um, then we have this term compositionality that I've shown you, or periphrastic relations, or uh, Boolean construct, like we recognize when we can uh, apply this different from. 
uh, or having propositions uh, as arguments, so kind of meta-level. And, um, and in general, I would say that these heuristics has been implemented as rules, but currently via scripts, but we are moving to these uh, stumble rules um, uh, representation that is, uh, can be done in Reef or in Sparkle 1.1. So um, then we, I, uh, we have this idea of hybridization. So we actually, in order to obtain things like NER, entity resolution, disambiguation, and alignment, we reuse components that are also you know, off the shelf. And um, then this is the architecture in general. So we have uh, the engineering component that reuses Boxer, and we got the output in the discourse representation structures from Boxer. And um, then we have these uh, refactoring components that produce the URI, but also uh, transform the output, the pure uh, output of Boxer in, by using the heuristics. And then we format them uh, with the Urifier. And then we have the communication component, which we have uh, the HPT server, and also the, the plugins that are the off-the-shelf components, and also a REST API to other tools, for example. Tipalo is a, is a tool like that. Um, that will be presented at ISWC in uh, next month. And um, it's, in, it's an indirect also evaluation of FRED performances because this, the results of this automatic typing that we did with this other tool is uh, for Wikipedia entities are quite good. And by the way, also this will be available in the, in the demo uh, this afternoon. So these are the uh, online um, URIs for uh, FRED and uh, the, um, the REST service and will be as an open source soon. So ongoing future work, and I, and I close here. So we have to evaluate FRED results now based on domain task coverage and accuracies, accuracy with reference to ontology design criteria. This is, of course, the one that, in principle, we would have expected to uh, before, but we wanted to reach a certain stability before actually uh, evaluating directly the ontology results. And also to compare FRED to other tools that can be considered as robust ontology learning. This is the case of OntoCase, um, Eva Blomqvist's tool that uses design patterns for augmenting, uh, for example, text-to-onto results, which text-to-onto is a quite known uh, ontology learning tool, and also the Lodifier that I already mentioned that was also based on Boxer, but that does not apply these, uh, uh, these heuristics. Uh, also, we, we are studying more heuristics, for example, for special text types, for a typology of text, which is not just a description or definition. And um, there is the big issue of multilinguality, because if you want to port this to other languages, the problem is where you find components as good as uh, the ones that um, make able uh, Boxer to produce these results. So the one of the problems is having a big tree bank, for example, that, uh, for categorical grammar. And eventually also compliance to NIF. We have seen this morning a presentation about that. So I mean, the output that is also uh, um, producible in NIF terms is quite, uh, quite handy. OK, so this is the, um, again. And uh, don't miss the Fred demo today. Thanks. Uh, because it's one order of magnitude uh, slower. slower. So, so it's just a practical matter. You needed to go fast and it was impractical to do the work. Yeah, sure. Also, you know, semaphore, it's, uh, the, the experiment there, the evaluation was co concentrated on uh, the frame detection. But of course, we do more than frame detection here. So with the semaphore, you don't have all the basic uh, functionalities that make the results more robust. For example, when you don't find uh, some thematic roles within the frame net structure, things remain, you know, cannot be used at all. And that while Boxer is, uh, since it's basically a, a semantic interpretation of uh, a categorical grammar results, provides you the full-fledged uh, analysis in semantic terms. By the way, indeed, if semaphore would be faster, we could refine the analysis of Boxer by using semaphore output. Sure. The idea is to hybridize everything. We don't care about defending one <laughs> viewpoint or the other. It's, the, it's quite pragmatic in this way. I missed a little bit the concept of uh, <coughs> the, the, the punchline, you know, about body of tool. And of course, that probably will be the next paper 
when you can evaluate the, the point of view of ontology learning. But um, uh, because, of course, you, you know that ontology learning, uh, um, there's a lot of work on ontology learning, and, but there are different types of outputs in, in terms of, uh, um, <coughs> in, in terms of actually the pragmatics of the output. You know, a, a lot of tools simply want to give you vocabularies. Uh, some tools give you vocabularies plus, uh, you know, uh, interactive with the too. So, I mean, can, can you tell us a little bit what, where you think uh, <coughs> you can go with these tools? To what extent, for example, you can uh, use this tool to build slightly more sophisticated ontologies than what you get from ontology language systems, and what properties do you learn? Yeah. No, the, the point about pragmatics is, uh, is central. So the problem is here, for example, you get something which is not just a vocabulary. So th there is a vocabulary which is hidden here. But originally, the, our first idea was, uh, let's get something that we can clearly distinguish into T-box and A-box, for example. Okay? But then what happened is that uh, if you want to clearly distinguish that, you have also to make assumptions of what is the validity of a T-box extracted from one sentence, for example would be just an ontology module which is completely local to that sentence, or you are entitled to produce a T-box only when you provide, I don't know, 1,000 texts that are representative enough for that. Okay. So for sure, you can, uh, pragmatically, you can do that. So you, you just take the elements that can be in a T-box and you produce something. You can even imagine some uh, inductive techniques to produce uh, existentially quantified restrictions, for example, and then uh, enrich the T-box in that way. Um, but then, for example, if you want to do that and you provide only the documents for which you want to build an ontology, this is the route you can, you can follow. So that's where we want to modularize the different output in terms of pragmatics. The other one is if I have a, a factual description, I don't want to produce maybe in the first, uh, in the, uh, first glance a T-box, but I want to have uh, information extraction. So I, what I was showing here is that the tasks of, uh, when you move from text, the tasks of distinguishing between factual, definitional, or uh, ontolo fully ontology learning pragmatics, or even emotional pragmatics, I don't know, would be, uh, uh, would be very important in order to, to decide what output you want to produce at the end. But in the, in the, in the first, uh, you have uh, no, the possibility of producing artifact output. Then you decide what to do with that. So in a sense, there is a second level refactoring that you can uh, operate on, uh, on what you get from here. So th from the first results we have, uh, this is particularly true. So this is not necessarily the final form you want to evaluate. There can, this can be also an intermediate form to which you apply more refactoring strategies for uh, producing something that is uh, appropriate to your own uh, task. Okay. I don't know. Super short. Sure. Definitely. Or for a knowledge extraction, if you want. Jamie's got a quick question. If you can answer this thing. Okay, I have. Yeah, I'm interested to see the DRT framework that we use as a kind of interface for ontology learning from text. I was wondering if it would make sense to translate RDF all to DRT framework for supporting information extraction and ontology population. Yeah, that's the. Is there a bidirectional translation mechanism for C? Uh, you mean if I can distinguish the different outputs in uh, no, based on? Translate your own ontology yeah. uh, into RDF, um, DRT and FrameNet, so that you give this to the link, computation linguistic as template to be built. Yeah, sure. No, that, that's a good idea, indeed. Yeah, but I think yes, it's just a matter of deciding what formats you need. Also based on what are the, their their data models, by the way, that they are using, so what they need to get. In this sense, the interoperability that we get with uh, NIF or other, other models like Lemon it could be very useful for that. Okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, thanks. Okay, thanks. I have to move, yeah. <laughs>